I want to talk about the Fair Deal panel report. The Alberta government, after it was elected, put together this panel to look at how Alberta could get a more fair deal in Confederation. And whether that's to placate growing separatist sentiment or a good faith push to actually find ways to get a better arrangement uh, with Ottawa, that's perhaps an open question. But the panel was put together to look at how a fair deal might look. The UCP under Premier Jason Kenney put together this panel. And as often happens with these panels, it's a kind of a way to put your friends on it. Uh, they get to go do something important, but you can learn a lot about something by the panel itself. Let's quickly look at who they put on this panel. So on the panel here, we have a lifelong bureaucrat, then we have Preston Manning, who uh, many would argue in some respects sold out Western Canada earlier in his life. Then we have a government crony, basically a government uh, crony capitalist who uh, gets money from the government for his uh, entrepreneurial efforts. We have a um, First Nations fellow here. I don't know too much about him. Then we have a politician and bureaucrat. We have an academic. We have a relatively pro-Alberta politician in Drew Barnes. And then we have two other politicians. So the panel goes around the province and it takes a few months. They get some online engagement and they talk to some people at some town hall kind of events and they get all kinds of opinions from all kinds of different Albertans about what they think should be pursued for a fair deal or, or maybe uh, scary thoughts people have about uh, how a fair deal might be worse for them in some way. So obviously there's a lot of frustration that Albertans feel in Canada right now. And that comes from a lot of things, uh, a lot of them economic in nature. First of all, you've got uh, the so-called No More Pipelines bill and the tanker ban bill, which are often considered to be legislative efforts that specifically target Alberta's economy and hamper its ability to produce uh, value for the economy. But of course, there's uh, byproducts of the huge transfers of money that occur from Alberta to Ottawa and the current uh, economic problems in Alberta because of many of these constraints and productivity sucking factors that are involved. And it manifests in reduced confidence in the economy, more bankruptcies, more suicide. The motivation behind this whole fair deal thing is pretty nicely represented actually in a graphic that's included in the report. And in this graphic, we see a map of Canada and we see that Western Canada seems far less happy with the country than Eastern Canada. And interestingly, Manitoba not included, the provinces that are making larger net contributions to the federal government are less happy and the ones receiving those contributions are more happy. So that's another way of saying that the tax consumer class is happier than the tax producing class. So the report, which was delayed because of the whole uh, COVID virus panic, finally came out and it was full of recommendations, more than 20 different recommendations. For today, we want to go through these recommendations and we can basically sort them into a few different categories. Some of them are pretty much completely pointless and don't matter at all. Some others are actually counterproductive and stupid. And then finally, there's a few recommendations that as far as Alberta's greater independence or sovereignty or control over its own affairs are concerned, are relatively okay or better as recommendations. Let's start with the recommendations that don't even really matter. So one of the recommendations to start things off here is strengthen Alberta's presence in Ottawa. Now really, why do we want to do that? The whole premise here is that we want to depend on Ottawa for less. Why do we want to be more aggressively begging for scraps in Ottawa? It sounds like a lot of that kind of social license stuff that the former government under Rachel Notley was uh, really pushing for, where basically it's selling out Alberta, making shady deals in Ottawa where politicians and bureaucrats get ahead, but other people aren't helped. Another recommendation they offered in their uh, great wisdom and learning is to vigorously pursue access to markets for Alberta's exports. Well, what have we been doing the last few years? The whole reason we're looking for a fair deal is because our pursuit of access to these markets is being thwarted by Ottawa. This recommendation is pointless. So the next recommendation was to make no changes at this time to the administration of agreements that Alberta public agencies and municipalities have with the government of Canada. 
What they're talking about is, say, a situation where Ottawa um, gives some money to a municipality for infrastructure or a, or a cultural event or something like that. And basically, the Alberta government doesn't intervene in the process. So they're saying, uh, don't interfere with that. Well, yeah, if Ottawa wants to, uh, you know, give some of our money back for a road or something, sure, we can take it. But the whole point here is supposed to be trying to keep the money and keep the control ourselves and get Ottawa out of these things more. So the next recommendation was to abolish or at least change the residency requirement for the federal court. And basically what happens is there's a quota of French judges for federal appeals courts. And it ends up with a situation where, you know, lawyers who have practiced in Western Canada are underrepresented. The number given in the report is out of 60 federal court judges, only seven of them were Western Canadian lawyers. I mean, sure, whatever, the quota is stupid, but the priority as far as fair deal goes should not be having Albertans more involved in the federal judiciary, but to rather reduce the influence of the federal judiciary on Alberta. The next recommendation is to continue to challenge federal legislation that affects provincial jurisdiction. Well, the reason this is kind of a pointless recommendation is because, well, yeah, no kidding. Why do we need the panel to tell us this? The whole reason we're involved in this fair deal exercise in the first place is because, in part, the federal government is overstepping its limits and interfering in areas of provincial jurisdiction. That's the whole point. And besides, challenging these issues requires us fighting them in Ottawa's own courts. The deck is stacked against Alberta. It cannot ever truly win in Ottawa's own court system. Next, explore ways and means to affirm Alberta's cultural, economic, and political uniqueness in law and government policy. Well, I don't really think this is the best job for the government. The government does not define culture. When the government defines uh, your economic system, it can only lead to impoverishment and political uniqueness. I, I don't want to define a people by the politics. Culture has to be something that comes from the ground up, and it's in it's in the people's actions, their behavior, their the way they interact together. When the government says it wants to, or the government should explore this, it just means government committees, expensive people holding hearings and trying to define something that can't be defined in that way. The next pointless recommendation is to design and advance regional strategies for Northern development, and then ask Ottawa to implement them. And no one cares about this. The people in the Northern region should be the ones coming up with strategies for it, not everyone else who then goes to Ottawa and asks them to implement these uh, neat or cool plans that they have. We want to be less involved in Ottawa and we don't want to encourage our plans to be imposed through Ottawa on the North. Then we have one that might sound good, but it's basically pointless. And that's to push for the development of cross-border rights of way, unobstructed corridors within Canada to Tidewater and world markets. And you might have heard of the idea of uh, big energy corridors, basically that they can move like fiber optic cable and pipelines through without all the normal interference. But here's the thing. This doesn't address any of the problems that supposedly the energy corridor is there to fix. If you can't even build, say, Trans Mountain, what makes you think you're going going to get an energy corridor built across the entire country. The whole point of the issue around pipelines is that the system with Ottawa doesn't work. So why would we want to pursue a bigger project in the system that doesn't work? Our next recommendation is to secure a seat at the table when the federal government negotiates and implements international agreements and treaties affecting Alberta's interests. Do you want to know what it looks like having a seat at the table under the current model with Ottawa? Rachel Notley with Justin Trudeau selling out Alberta at the Paris Summit. Next up, we have resist federal government intrusions into health and social programming. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, good thing we put a panel together to tell us that. Now, the tax point thing is a little more complicated and they did not recommend it, but there is um, some intel that suggests the Alberta government is currently actively exploring this. And it's too complicated to talk about now, but the basic idea is it might provide some alternatives to getting out from under the boot of the Canada Health Act, which in a lot of ways holds Canada's healthcare system back at like a North Korea level. 
Then there's Alberta and its tax collection question. So the panel recommended to make no changes to tax collection in Alberta at this time, but on the other hand, also support Quebec in its bid to collect federal and provincial portions of personal income taxes. And if Quebec is successful in doing this, pursue the same strategy if it is advantageous. So they're recommending basically nothing happened. But um, as far as this issue goes, I mean, everyone obviously hates the CRA. Uh, there's some talk about like, oh, well, you know, you don't get any savings because you have to replace the CRA and have to hire a whole bunch of bureaucrats. Well, there's no reason you have to replace it. You could have a very alternative system if you got out from under Ottawa's system. Our next recommendation is to secure federal provincial agreement prohibiting Ottawa from spending, taxing, legislating, or treaty making in areas of provincial or joint jurisdiction without consent of affected provinces. Well, yeah, no kidding. Ottawa's already doing that, and that's why we're holding the goddamn hearings about a fair deal in the first place. Again, it, there's a common theme to these pointless recommendations. Apparently, they missed the reason why the panel exists in the first place. And here we have reduced trade barriers within Canada. Panel, thanks for the reminder. We're already supposed to be doing that. Canada is already supposed to have interprovincial free trade and we don't. Ottawa is not doing anything. So your recommendation is to ask them to do the thing that they're supposed to be doing that they're not doing. So then they say we should use democratic tools such as referenda and citizens initiatives to seek Albertans guidance on selected fair deal panel proposals and other initiatives. And, and I mean, that's fine. Sure. Whatever. Hopefully, if some of the fair deal panel proposals are good, we can have some influence on getting them in place. Uh, thanks. Really, really insightful, really helpful recommendation. The report truly wouldn't be complete without this. So we talked about the pointless recommendations that don't really do anything. Let's talk about the stupid recommendations, which would actually probably be counterproductive. So our first stupid recommendation is to appoint an Alberta chief firearms officer. The idea being, uh, yeah, so even if there's all these terrible gun laws coming out of Ottawa and uh, lots of people in Alberta hate these gun laws, well, you have a chief Alberta firearms officer to uh, exercise some discretion about the enforcement of these laws. But while that might sound good, you got to think about the kinds of people who wind up in these kinds of positions. And you got to think about the rather negative scenario where someone like a future Rachel Notley puts her friend in the position and maybe they use the discretion to more aggressively enforce Ottawa's terrible gun laws. So I don't really see how this is a valuable contribution and how it increases Alberta sovereignty when we want to get out of the bad federal laws in the first place. So another stupid recommendation, which uh, might actually seem positive in some way, is uh, to continue diversifying Alberta's economy in the energy sector and beyond. But you got to look a little deeper and you got to remember that the diversification of an economy is something that the people have to figure out on their own. When the government is in charge of diversifying the economy, it just means more cronyism, more micromanagement, more subsidies to inefficient industries and political buddies. And sure, we want our economy to be good, but we don't want the government choosing the direction that should go. And what does this have to do with helping Alberta in its struggles with Ottawa? Another recommendation is to advance market-based approaches to environmental protection, including reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And maybe you look at that and you see market-based approaches and that sounds uh, better than Ottawa or whatever. But when you actually look at what they're talking about in the report, it's basically a credit offset market that's brokered by the federal government. So it's kind of a stupid suggestion to have in a fair deal for Alberta type report, considering it would get your industries even more entangled with the federal government than they are already. To make a long story short, one of the big problems with these whole markets is that they basically reward the biggest, most powerful emitters and punish their competition. So it's not fair and generally not the outcome people want. And then we have this, Jim, to secure a fair share of federal civil service opportunities and federal offices in Western Canada. Who came up with this idea? I mean, what are they thinking? No one wants more federal government bureaucrats in Alberta. Get the hell out of here. We want less Ottawa, not more. And besides, federal government employees are usually the worst voters and you want as few of them as possible. So the last one on our list of stupid recommendations is 
about how we're represented in the parliament. So the recommendation is to press for strict implementation of the principle of representation by population in the House of Commons and democratize the Senate appointment process. So the main idea here is that if Alberta had a number of seats proportionate to its population in the parliament, it would gain five seats. And oh, well, that sounds pretty good because more seats in the parliament, more influence in Ottawa and the federal government. So isn't that good? But when you look at the full picture of how this breaks down, uh, Alberta doesn't necessarily seem like it comes ahead and it's possible they actually fall behind in this arrangement. Sure, they gain five seats, but Saskatchewan would lose three. And when it comes to Western Canada versus Ottawa, Saskatchewan is often an ally of Alberta in many of these issues. So that net gain if you think of it that way, isn't so good. Then you have to look at who else is gaining. Well, BC is gonna gain three seats, so them gaining seats might be bad. Ontario, which is kind of the heart of the problem in some ways, would gain seven seats, and that doesn't necessarily help Alberta, so we're kind of falling behind in this arrangement. Now, sure, some maritime provinces lose some seats, and Quebec, of course, loses some too. But while this all sounds like a big deal and Alberta comes ahead, it's not clear that that's true. And there's at least a meaningful possibility that it would be worse. So this is a stupid recommendation. Now we want to talk about the recommendations from the report that maybe are actually kind of good, even if only in a very small way. First up is the recommendation to create an Alberta police service to replace the RCMP. Now this can be kind of complicated, but to sum it up quickly, Alberta pays $262 million annually for RCMP service and the federal government pays $112 million on top of that. Wouldn't it be better if the federal government just let us keep that money? Because remember, they can only get their money from the provinces in the first place. And for $262 million that we're also paying into that, maybe we can come up with a better alternative. Apparently, although Ed Stelmack signed the contract to renew the agreement with the RCMP for 20 years, it can be ended earlier under a termination clause. A lot of people think this would be very important because it would uh, have a lot of symbolic value. It would send a message to Ottawa that we want more control over our affairs by basically kicking out Ottawa's police force and coming up with with something for ourselves. Now let's not forget that the RCMP is not exactly the friend of Alberta. It's Ottawa's police force and enforces Ottawa's laws and we pay for it. There's many stories recently of the RCMP arresting people for defending their property using firearms and self-defense and maybe we don't want our police to do that. Or think back to the great Alberta floods many years ago. There was the scandal where the RCMP was rolling around in High River, confiscating people's weapons, and it was a completely illegal thing for them to do. We have another good recommendation here, nice and simple. It's to assert more control over immigration for the benefit of Alberta. And whatever you think about the immigration issue, uh, I think it's reasonable to say that Ottawa should not make these decisions for the entire country. Different places have different needs, different priorities when it comes to immigration, and that should be more of a provincial and local matter, not something Ottawa has most influence on. Then we have the recommendation to opt out of new federal cost sharing programs subject to Alberta receiving full compensation. And I mean, part of the problem is that we're stuck with these current cost sharing programs, but as far as anything new that might be introduced, maybe the most obvious potential example that would come up is a national pharmacare program out of Ottawa. Alberta absolutely should stay out of anything like that because what this really means is that Ottawa taxes you, gets a big cut, and then redistributes some of the money to you with strings attached to do things as Ottawa wants, not necessarily what's best for the province. So this should be a no-brainer. Of course, they should stay out of this. It's a, it's a fine recommendation. The next recommendation, which is a little boring, is about the fiscal stabilization program. And basically it's this, uh, you can think of it as kind of like a tax credit for the province. If the province has a big hit to its fiscal situation, then it's supposed to get kind of like a rebate from Ottawa. So the idea with changing the current fiscal stabilization program is that there's these kind of arbitrary limits on how much resource revenue declines can count and it's maxed out at a certain number per person blah 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 it's boring but the end result would be i mean if they changed it and you could get these rules changed you would 
get a bunch of money back from Ottawa, which is better than Ottawa having it. So the next recommendation is a pretty important one because it deals with the referendum on equalization, which uh, Jason Kenney and the UCP government of Alberta now, they campaigned on it during the election. Equalization is not popular in Alberta. Now, even though a referendum on equalization doesn't solve all of the problems in Canada when it comes to Alberta's outsized contribution to the finances of the country, it's an important symbol to attack it with this referendum. The referendum on this constitutional issue will force Ottawa to basically come to the table and negotiate in good faith some change or a agreement. One thing is for sure is we probably can't expect Ottawa to just, you know, change its mind about its current relationship with Alberta and the West and the way it expropriates them. So, but what we might expect is that by triggering this constitutional negotiation, we get the situation where Ottawa, which isn't stupid, would try and present some kind of new, better arrangement that, say, Kenny can take back to prov the province and to clear a victory and say, hey, I got us a better deal. The reason this is important, no matter what the actual outcome is, is you have to say, well, we took a stab at fixing up the constitutional situation that makes this confederation inherently unfair. We failed. We need to look at our other options now. The next recommendation, which is pretty good, is to create an Alberta pension plan and withdraw from the Canada pension plan. The reason I think this is one of the best recommendations is because it would upset Ottawa the most and perhaps the most easily compared to some of the other things here. The Canada Pension Plan is not really a good deal for Alberta right now. Alberta has the youngest and most productive population out of all the people in all the provinces. In 2017, Alberta workers accounted for 16.5% of total Canada Pension Plan contributions, while Alberta retirees consumed only 10.8% of the program's expenditures. So it amounts to a net contribution by Albertans to the Canada Pension Plan of $2.9 billion in 2017. And if you look at the entire decade from 2008 to 2017, it was a net contribution of $27.9 billion. Now compare this to Ontario, which over the same 10-year period, despite having a much, much larger population than Alberta, their net contribution was only $7.4 billion, which is barely one quarter of Albertans' contribution. Obviously, this type of situation doesn't help Alberta. You're taking money from the most productive, youngest population and dishing it out to the rest of the province. That's obviously a net drain on Alberta. Actually, if you go by the 2018 contribution rates, the Canada Pension Plan is unsustainable without Alberta. The 2018 contribution rate uh, was 9.9%, although it has since increased. And there's no reason to think you're getting any real big economy of scale with this big federal Canada pension plan. A former chief analyst at Statistics Canada, Mr. Philip Cross, he completed an analysis of the fund's costs compared to other large public pensions. And he found that the Canada pension plan had the highest cost. And there's also dis economies of scale that come into play when these funds get larger and larger. As the funds become bigger, they have to engage in more complex investment strategies. It's not necessarily just cheaper the bigger it gets. The Toronto-based Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, which manages more than 400 billion in assets of the fund and has more than 1,800 employees, is almost all based in downtown Toronto. So again, Alberta is basically subsidizing these uh, well-paid Crown Corporation positions in Toronto. If Alberta had its own fund, it would actually have a much lower contribution rate than is currently required for the Canada Pension Plan. If you use the standard methodology employed by the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions, Alberta would pay just about half for its own program. So the reason I like all this, on top of the fact that it would be a lower cost for Albertans, I think Ottawa would be on its knees pretty quick over this issue. I don't think Ottawa wants to have to go to the rest of the country and tell them they have to pay more for the Canada Pension Plan because Alberta's gone. I also like the fact that Alberta can just do this. It doesn't need the other provinces. It doesn't need Ottawa's permission. 
And on top of being better on the whole for Albertans, it also attacks Ottawa right where it hurts, right in the pocketbook, right in the treasury. So that's it. That's all the recommendations from the fair deal panel. Um, even though a lot of uh, air has been sucked out of some issues these days because of the whole virus panic and everything, the fair deal panel, despite its flaws, still contains a few good ideas that could have enough popular support that the government feels compelled to move forward on them. And there's hopefully some progress to be made going forward on some of these things that can actually maybe lead to a better arrangement for Alberta within or without confederation. 